Hi, hello friends. Welcome everyone to Invest10, India's largest retail investors online conference. I am Ashok Devanampriya, the CEO of Traders Gurukul and also the host for today's program. It's a great pleasure to invite every one of you to Invest10 1.0. This is the first and foremost edition, particularly focused on investors. I'm sure by the end of this program, you will have extensive knowledge which can help you to make better decisions in your investing life. I would like to thank our media partner Money Control Pro, the largest financial portal in India with millions of daily readership on their website. They helped us to achieve and reach a wider audience in a short span of time. We would like to appreciate our title sponsor, Sher Khan, one of the leading stockbrokers in India with millions of investors as their customers. The speaker for today is Mr. Gautam Bait, CFA. He's the founder of Stellar Wealth Partners, a semi register research analyst firm, and small case manager for investors in the Indian stock market. He is also the founding creator at Chapter, a curation based learning platform where he teaches the discipline of investing. Gautam is author of the international bestseller on value investing, The Joys of Compounding. In fact, he comes from the city of Joy, Kolkata. Previously, he served as a portfolio manager at Sumit Global Investments, an SEC registered investment advisor based in Salt Lake City, USA. Gautam is a CFA holder and also a member of the CFA Institute. And in the year 2018 and 19, he was profiled in Morningstar's Learn from the Master Series. Mr. Gautam, it is a great pleasure to have you today in our program as the first speaker and also the keynote speaker. On behalf Thank of the Guru, introduction, Money Control Pro, Sher Khan, I extend my warm welcome to you into this program as an elite speaker. Thank you very much, sir, for being with us here. Go ahead. The stage is yours. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction, Ashok. It is a pleasure to be here and uh, I hope me along with all the other speakers uh, for this event will add a lot of value to the participants over the coming days. So the topic I'm going to talk about today is the discipline of investing. A uh, warm note of thanks to our title sponsor, Sher Khan. Ashok, would you like me to run the uh, Sher Khan video now? We will drive it during the uh, promo time, sir. All right. So before we begin, a standard disclaimer that this presentation is solely for information and knowledge sharing purposes and that the stock examples shown are for understanding concepts and should not be considered as stock recommendations. Stellar Wealth Partners is a SEBI registered research analyst firm and we may hold some or all of the discussed stocks from this presentation in our proprietary accounts or small case model portfolios. It is also possible that we may have exited or may exit from these stocks in future without prior notification. So please do your own research and due diligence for any investment actions and consult a registered financial advisor for the same. And the views expressed are my own personal views and do not represent the views of any entity or organization. This is the standard disclosure as per the SEBI regulations for research analyst firms. The most important one being the first one, uh, whether the research analyst or research entity or its, or its associates or relatives have any financial interest in the subject company and the nature of such financial interest. So the research entity Stellavel Partners and its associates may own or may have owned in the past some of the stocks discussed in this presentation. With that out of the way, let's uh, briefly touch upon the flow of today's presentation. So I'll be taking everyone through my investing framework with the help of case studies from the Indian stock market and I'll conclude the presentation with a brief about how value investing is a life discipline. So all the great investors in the world have one common attribute. They all have a clearly defined investment philosophy and that investment philosophy in turn is driven by their personal experiences, vicarious learning from other investors, through books and other uh, reading material. In my case, these are the books that have defined my personal investment philosophy over the years. Terry Smith's Investing for Growth taught me how to invest in high quality businesses for the long term. 
capital returns edited by edward chancellor taught me how to invest in commodities and cyclical businesses by making use of the capital cycle theory and joel greenblatt's you can be a stock market genius taught me how to invest in various special situations like block deals reverse mergers and demergers and other special situations this in a brief is a snapshot of my investment process flow at any particular point of time i have an active watch list of ideas that i am monitoring on a regular basis and i track their performance and i also keep collecting uh, the feedback on the management execution and the business prospects to that active watch list new ideas get added from time to time through my idea generation process and i finally come to an active watch list of 10 to 15 high potential opportunities those in turn feed into my portfolio construction and portfolio tracking and rebalancing process which we'll discuss now so uh, the portfolio on an average comprises of 20 to 30 names and the aim is to generate 20 to 25% cagr on a portfolio level over a minimum holding period of 3 plus years at any point of time i follow a sector and market cap agnostic investing approach with a bias towards under researched and well run small to mid cap companies there is no hard cap on the contribution to the portfolio from any one single idea or sector or market cap range but prudence is always maintained at all times the weight per stock ranges from 3 to 5 percent at cost and the exceptional opportunities sometimes may get an allocation of 10 percent in the very beginning the decision to exit any investment is solely based on the underlying business performance or the potential incremental irr from the current market price and a portion of the portfolio is kept in cash if the valuations of the existing holdings or the watch list become exorbitant as far as portfolio tracking goes i track the industry trends of all my portfolio companies and watch list companies they include ch changes in competitive landscape technology changes changes in government regulations any supply chain disruptions the quarterly results of each company is benchmarked against that of the competitors and the results are evaluated accordingly and a detailed diligence is carried out in case the investment's performance is not as per the initial investment hypothesis. Finally, we come to the rebalancing piece. Any investment is sold only if its valuations become absolutely expensive or if there is a structural challenge to its business fundamentals. The portfolio companies are periodically ranked based on valuations, earnings performance, expected future stock returns from the current market price, and the rebalance is done accordingly. And fresh or follow on investment in an idea is done only if it can deliver an attractive IRR over a period of the next three years. Now, here I would like to add a very important point about portfolio rebalancing that ultimately all intelligent investing is a function of opportunity cost. If you have a, some good stocks in your portfolio and you come across a much more greater potential opportunity, you should not hesitate to replace the existing stock from your portfolio in favor of the new opportunity provided that the new opportunity is significantly better than that what you own in your portfolio now we come to the crux of today's presentation which is how do i go about generating new ideas and this is a, com a question which i very commonly encounter as to how do i go about generating new stock ideas for my portfolio and the watch list and this in a nutshell is the summary of my idea generation process starting with the main source which is the primary uh, data of bsc corporate announcements every day i diligently review all of the corporate announcements on the bombay stock exchange website and for many it is a tedious exercise but for me it is like an intellectual treasure hunt wherein i may strike gold anytime through this particular process every single day i am creating numerous opportunities for serendipity to find me i review press releases investor presentations m a deal joint venture and partnership agreements when i evaluate quarterly results i'm on the lookout for what i call breakout earnings so breakout earnings refers to companies whose earnings per share has gone up by 300 to 400 percent year on year whose revenues have gone up by 50 to 100 percent year on year and in such cases of such breakout earnings generally the stock market is slightly slow to adjust the stock price to the right deserved higher level so even if you buy these stocks 15 percent higher the next day after the earnings you still end up making good returns i also go through the conference calls of my portfolio holdings and watch list companies on trendline alpha street research bytes even the company website investor relations section is a good source for getting hold of conference calls especially that of microcap companies 
a peculiar problem with many indian promoters is that they tend to be overly bullish during the good times so it is very important to co corroborate and cross check what they are saying with what their global peers are saying so i also go through the commentary of the global peers and their uh, outlook on the future business prospects and i also go through the management interviews of my portfolio holdings and watchlist companies on print and digital media for screening tools i use tejori finance and screener.in tejori finance in particular is a great uh, resource for getting operational metrics of a large number of companies in great detail and you can also track various chemicals and commodity prices on tejori finance on screener.in i look for companies that have either completed a big capex or are on the verge of completing a very big capex i also look for stocks which are hitting a 52 week high an all time high or a post ipo new high when i talk about post ipo new high i'm referring to situations where after the initial listing dip off the stock has gone into a long term time consolidation for 8 9 10 months and once the stock breaks out to a new high after that long time period consolidation it generally coincides with something important taking place in that company so that is a good place for beginning your research on such companies and when you're evaluating uh, stocks which are hitting 52 week high or all time highs it's very important to understand for all techno fund investors that time frame matters when you're evaluating price action context matters when you're evaluating price action in case during a bull market you'll see many stocks hitting 52 week highs on a regular basis so in such cases you look for stocks which are hitting multi year highs immediately after a bear market crash you look for stocks which are hitting a 3 month or a 6 month high and in case of non trending or range bound or sideways market you look for stocks which are breaking out to fresh 52 week highs so time frame and context matters when you evaluate price action i read the equity research reports of the companies that i'm tracking uh, there are certain brokers who issue good quality research reports uh, they include ambit icic securities spark capital indian info line nimble mang and axis i also go through the annual reports and credit rating reports of the companies that i'm tracking draft red herring prospectuses and qualified institutional placement qip offering documents are a rich source for gathering underlying industry information on the companies and industries that you're tracking for instance if anyone wants to get a solid grasp of the music licensing industry in india they can refer to the recent qip offering document of a company named saragama limited not a stock recommendation i also read the investor letters of fund managers whom i admire and respect they include solidarity sage one equirus also attend the investing conclaves like tamil nadu investor association india investing conclave as far as webinars goes soic webinars are a very good source for idea generation a less talked about but highly useful resource for idea generation is fund managers top 5 holdings from pms bazaar website the sign up and the login on this website is free and once you have logged in you can actually access the top 5 holdings along with their respective weightages of uh, the fund managers who run pmss in india and that is a good uh, starting source for id generation i also review the bulk deals block deals and insider bank information on a daily basis stockage does a very good uh, job of uh, collecting all the data for these three pieces of information i also review the 52 week high volume list on a daily basis because if any stock is experiencing a 52 week high volume on a particular day it generally coincides with something important taking place in either that company or its underlying industry as far as magazines go i like to read forbes india fortune india and outlook business for newspapers i like to read the economic times i also go through the industry specific websites for instance for commodities i look at plats.com for chemicals i go through chemical weekly and for steel industry i look at steel mint along along with this i also have daily discussions with my peers and colleagues and i also look out for the views of the leading analysts of individual sectors finally we have social media forums like twitter whatsapp groups and telegram channels and online forums like value picker and multipy now here i ask all of you one question if you go through this extensive list for the re remaining part of your investing careers how can you not be simply flooded with great opportunities all the time be it a bull market or a bear market or a sideways market in life business or investing nothing will work unless you do and you have to work hard today to let good luck find you in future 
this is one of the most important slides in today's presentation and it is something which i'll keep referring to back again and again which is that all the great investors in the world have one common attribute it is a relentless focus on the underlying process and i've talked about the importance of this in my book as well and i quote from it numerous research studies have identified a common trait among successful professionals in fields of probabilistic activity they all emphasize process over outcome if you focus only on the outcome you are less likely to achieve it instead if you focus on adhering to a sound process the outcome will take care of itself in the long term although the short term results almost always will be driven by luck over the long run a sound process can be counted on to deliver desirable results in a sustained manner and produce more reliable outcomes and michael morbison has spent some gems gems on this topic in the past and i quote him in a probabilistic environment you are better served by focusing on the process by which you, by which you make a decision than on the outcome we have no control over outcomes but we can control the process of course outcomes matter but by focusing our attention on process we maximize our chances of good outcomes i follow a multi pronged approach for idea generation i track key company metrics like leaders in niche sectors with low competition healthy balance sheets high returns on capital employed good revenue growth i track the investment activities of private equity funds hedge funds and mutual funds whom i admire and, and admire and respect and i also track the insider buying data and the views of the respected individual investors whom i follow i also track the industry developments like sectors undergoing supply side consolidation because as supply side gets more consolidated and competitive intensity go competitive intensity goes down the profitability of the incumbents tend to, tends to go up i also track the regulatory changes of the industries in which my companies operate and i also am on the lookout for emerging sectoral sectoral adoption trends so a good example here is how we consume music in the past we used to consume music through the use of audio cds and audio cassettes but today we consume music through streaming applications like spotify gana savan wink youtube etc but one of my fa most favored approaches for idea generation is through tracking corporate events namely change in promoter and management block deals merger arbitrage demergers and companies having con concluded a significant capex let's look at a few case studies for each of these topics starting with change in promoter and management so the stock of cg power in august 2000 20 was trading at sub 10 rupees and in 2019 the company had been hit with a 3000 crore rupee fraud and the company was in doldrums during august, as of august 2020 now enter the murugoppa group from south india which enjoys stellar reputation for corporate governance and what happens in the stock market is when a company with low perceived standards of corporate governance or mismanaged state of affairs is taken over by a group with strong past track record of corporate governance and strong track strong track record of execution you get an opportunity for massive wealth creation because of stock price re-rating and the company gets re-rated the stock of cg power since august 2020 ever since the takeover by murugoppa group has gone up by more than 1500% now this particular special situation has already worked out but it's very important to focus on pattern recognition and fo focus on improving our underlying process because opportunities and patterns in the market keep on coming time and again so let's look at a live case study from the indian stock market this is not a stock recommendation and uh, all the readers are advised to do their own due diligence here is a company named everedy industries which recently uh, for which recently the uh, burman family which owns the dabur dabur group they have made an open offer to acquire uh, 26% stake in the company and they already at present hold 25% stake so they'll become the majority owners of this business once the open offer gets completed now it's very important to understand the background for any uh, promoter management change situation we always need to understand the background as to why did this particular event take place so everedy industries is actually a company which has got a strong brand recall and strong brand equity in the two businesses which it operates in namely dry cell batteries and flashlights and many people will be surprised to know that everedy industries has more than 50% market share in the organized segment for dry cell batteries 
and flashlights and both these business segments of everity are cash cows they both have returns on equity of more than 30% and the return on capital employed is 25% but because uh, the uh, erstwhile promoters which was the khatan family which owned the everity uh, group they were mired in a variety of problems so they were not able to give the due focus on this particular company everity the revenue growth between 2010 and 2020 was a merry 1% cagr and at the same time the reason for this particular promoter management change happened because the khatan family basically their shareholding over the last few years has come down from 44 from 44% to just barely less to barely less than 5% i believe they own just 4.8% of the company now the reason for the drastic fall in the promoter shareholding of everity is that the, they had pledged their shares to the bank and once one of their group companies mcnally defaulted the banks basically sold uh, the pledged shares in the market and that is how the barman family was able to build a sizable position and sizable stake in this business from the open market at the same time the khatan family of everdy group had to sell their surplus land in chennai and hyderabad to pay down their debt and they also had to sell their loss making tea business so the entire promoter group was mired in a series of problems and the underlying business is very profitable it's cash flow generative now the barman family which has got a stellar track record of corporate governance and execution we have all seen the massive wealth creation they've done with dabur for investors in the indian stock market now once the open offer gets completed all the that the barman family has to do is use everity's existing brand equity and extensive distribution reach pan india to use the tactic of brand extension and product extension so apart from uh, dry cell batteries and flashlights now the barman family is also going to invest a lot in uh, leveraging the existing distribution network for selling electricals lighting and small home appliances and this is a situation in which uh, the valuation rating of the company is very visible especially as the execution starts showing up over the next few years the next first for idea generation which i would like to discuss now is that of block deals now sometimes in the stock market what happens is that a company reports a blockbuster quarterly earnings report but the stock price does not react it does not go anywhere in fact it sometimes declines and many investors are perplexed as to how is this even possible it is possible because there may be a big institutional sh- shareholder or institutional investor who is trying to exit the stock for some short term technical reason for instance the particular fund may be facing a redemption request or a new fund manager may have joined the fund who wants to do who, who wants to have nothing to do with this particular stock whatever be the technical reasons for selling as value investors we are focused on the underlying business and we are focused on intrinsic value we are focusing on getting a good deal and whenever someone sells in desperation they tend to sell cheap and as a buyer i love to be on the opposite side of such trades in which the other party is being forced to liquidate holdings at any price regardless of underlying value this is a special situation on june 15th it was reported that templeton strategic emerging markets fund had sold 2.36 lakh shares of global spirits at 430 rupees per share and this sale by this fund coincided with the blockbuster quarterly earnings report by global spirits and once the selling pressure got absorbed the stock of global spirits in the last 6 to 7 months has given more than 200% returns the, now we keep not having bull deals and block deals on, on bull deals and block deals on a regular basis in the stock market but the reason i wanted to emphasize this special situation was that we want to be on the lookout for block deals in case of companies which have just reported a blockbuster quarterly earnings report because in those situations the stock becomes like a coil spring it's wanting to move forward and burst on the upside but because of this forced selling in the short term the stock price is compressed and depressed that therein lies the opportunity for us as value investors the next source for id generation is that of merger arbitrage so under the pen name cogitator benjamin graham had written several articles for the analyst journal and he penned a seminal article on special situations in the fourth quarter 1946 issue in which he wrote in the broader sense a special situation is one in which a particular development is counted upon to yield a satisfactory profit in the security even though the general market does not advance 
in the narrow sense you do not have a real special situation unless the particular development is already underway and Graham concluded the article by summing up the essence of a special situation as an expected corporate development within a time period estimable in the light of past experience. Now for all the advocates of efficient markets, let's look at what happened last year in, in late January 2021. So on 24th January 2021, I tweeted about a merger arbitrage opportunity in Haitha seating. So Minda Industries announced the merger of Haitha seating with itself at a 1.52 to 1 merger ratio. And watch what was happening here. The current price of Minda Industries on that day was 508. So based on the merger ratio of 1.52 to 1, for every one single share of Haitha seating, you would get shares of Minda Industries worth 508 into 1.52 equal to 772. But what was the stock price of Haitha sitting on that day 534 which meant that you could have simply made 40 percent returns in a few months time just for holding on to your shares and doing nothing in early February Minda Industries reported a blockbuster set of quarterly num numbers and because of the merger ratio of 1.52 to 1 for every 10 percent up move in Minda Industries stock the investors in Haitha seating would enjoy 15.2 percent capital appreciation and this was a special situation in which a patient investor would get paid for just waiting. The next day on 5th February, the merger came one step closer to completion. And finally on 9th April, the stock of Haitha seating was delisted from the exchanges at a price of 766. And what was the price just two and a half months ago for Haitha seating? 534. So you could have made more than 40% returns in just two and a half months just by making use of this merger arbitrage and looking at the merger ratio. Now, ask all of our audience to look at two live case studies from the Indian market based on merger arbitrage. In February 2021, APL Apollo announced the merger of Apollo Tricot with itself at a 1 is to 1 ratio. And in July 2021, Equitas Holdings announced the merger of Equitas Small Finance Bank with itself at a 2.26 to 1 merger ratio. Everyone should check the stock prices of these four companies to see if there is any merger arbitrage opportunity available currently or not. Not a stock recommendation. This is more of an educational exercise. The next source for added generation is that of companies which have concluded a very big capex. Now watch this is a snapshot of a company from screener and just watch what is happening here. The gross block or the fixed assets of this company have more than doubled from March to September. 2021 and it's a pretty well managed company. Uh, it has in the past reported ROCs of 33.4%, 28.3%, 29%. But in the latest financial year of March 2021, they reported a tiny loss. Now, if you were using a mechanical screener in which one of the criteria was net profit more than zero, then you would end up missing such opportunities because these are the opportunities in which an investor needs to put in the work to a deep dive and understand as to how a well-managed company suddenly reported a loss. In this case, the loss took place because the company shut down their existing plant for five months to, synchron to synchronize with the new plant. And for five months, while no revenue, while there was zero revenue, the company kept on incurring the fixed cost. But now the plant integration has, has been completed and uh, the profits and revenues from the new plant have already started being generated. In the latest, most recent quarter, the company reported a blockbuster set of numbers. But when they reported a tiny loss, the stock market, because of myopic uh, short term mindset, they basically hammered down the stock 50% from its 50 to week high. So that was the opportunity for value investors to buy a business at 50, at basically half the market cap and at, at a depressed valuation. And the stock has done pretty well since then. You will always take one of these four risks when you buy a stock business risk, management risk valuation risk and industry risk and there are only four things that can happen in investing a big profit a big loss a small profit or a small loss if you can eliminate the big losses you shall do very well there is no bigger mistake in investing than holding on to your losers for a long time going wrong occasionally is perfectly acceptable but staying wrong after knowing the facts that is not acceptable so how do you eliminate the big losses well to eliminate the big losses and avoid the big losses there are certain things which I strive to avoid both as an investor for my personal portfolio 
and for my small case clients namely investing in commodity and cyclical businesses near the peak of the cycle because at the peak of the cycle these commodity companies tend to look the cheapest investing in government owned companies because the promoter key motivation is not wealth creation for shareholders investing in project based businesses dealing with government tenders investing in melting ice cubes or what i call value traps these are businesses that look optically cheap but they are cheap for a reason a good example here is the newspaper industry in india so these newspaper stocks have looked cheap for many years and they will remain cheap and unless and until they pivot to the digital medium because the paper uh, print industry newspaper industry is an industry in secular decline i also avoid venturing outside my circle of competence driven by the lure of quick short term returns in bull markets and one of the key challenges with investing in the indian market is that many companies have bad accounting quality and poor standards of corporate governance so a question which i often get asked is that being based out of the, out of the us how am i able to evaluate the management qualities of the businesses that i invest in in india without actually meeting the management physically it is through the use of a comprehensive corporate governance checklist and a rigorous diligence process which i use to avoid potential errors of commissions i look out for any frequent change in auditors any qualifications raised by the auditors any abnormal auditor fees is the auditor fees growing faster than revenue growth does the company have a long list of unaudited foreign subsidiaries does the promoter have any political affiliations or criminal proceedings against him has the company been subjected to cbi or enforcement directed or it raids in the past or has it been the subject of any sebi debarment what is the history of attrition among the senior level management is the key management personnel drawing excessive remuneration or are they blowing large sums on a corporate office and destroying majority shareholders wealth what is the history of equity dilution what is the promoter pledge shares percentage is the promoter holding coming down has the company shared wealth with majority shareholders in the past through dividends and share buybacks what are the credit rating reports saying about the company are there any, any related pi transactions what is the view of the current and ex employees of the company you can get these information on websites like glassdoor what are the industry experts saying about the company what are the reputed investors saying about the company is the promoter having a similar business as the listed entity in his privately held company because that may lead to a conflict of interest i also evaluate the accounting quality when i say evaluation of accounting quality i look for items like volatility in depreciation rates because the depreciation depreciation rate can be modified modified by the management to manipulate earnings i also check if any expenses have been directly written off from the reserves and surpluses on the balance sheet instead of being routed through the profit and loss statement thus inflating profit is the company following an aggressive revenue recognition policy is the business very working capital intensive what is the trend in accounts receivable and inventory days what is the trends in historical cfo to ebitda and cfo to pat ratio if a commodity company is enjoying abnormally high margin versus its peers then that should make you sit up and take notice and be on high alert because it's not usually normal for a commodity company to earn 30% margins while its other peers are running 10% margins in such cases a deep dive is necessary i also check whether there have been any excessive write offs of assets in the past has the company been capitalizing its operating expenses to smoothen smoothen out earnings what are the trends in the debt to equity ratio has the company defaulted on any statutory payments in the past does it have any high contingent liabilities are there any off balance sheet obligations for instance has the promoter given any guarantees on his group company's debt through the listed entity now many of you may ask what is the need to do so much work who looks at cash flow and balance sheet uh, during let alone the footnotes to the accounts during a bull market the response to that is that when you are in charge of advising working class families and individuals on investing their hard earned savings then you owe it to them to reciprocate their trust in you and following this checklist as in a few months ago actually helped me avoid including a particular company from my flexi cap small case the company the management was constantly coming on various business channels and giving very bullish commentary and announcing very high profile foreign joint ventures and everything looked very hunky dory and rosy for the business but one deep dive into the annual report of the company and there were red flags galore 
and these are the kind of companies whose stock prices get decimated during a bear market because a bull market may not differentiate between good and bad corporate governance but a bear market is one where clear differentiation takes place between well managed good corporate governance companies and badly managed poor corporate governance companies that is where permanent loss of capital takes place in the latter group of companies lastly the important thing that i strive to avoid as an investor is taking a short term view because investing is a long term game the more time you give it the higher the odds of success and why do i say that it's because in the short term of less than 1 year almost 46% of a stock price movement is explained by changes in the valuation multiple which in turn is driven by changes in the public market sentiment but over the long run of 10 years and more almost 90% of the stock price performance is explained by sales and profit growth and one of the this is one of the best books on valuation which i've read it's titled valuation measuring and managing the value of companies and which in which the authors write and i quote we have found empirically that long term revenue growth particularly organic revenue growth is the most important driver of shareholder returns for companies with higher returns on capital this book is a must read for all serious investors in the stock market traditionally there have been three sources of edge for the individual investor number one the information information edge but with the widespread uh, dissemination of information through the internet the information edge is no longer present the second source of edge traditionally for investors has that been of the analytical edge but with more and more smart people entering the investing profession even the analytical edge is fast getting compressed but the one edge which is the most durable and sustainable in my view is that of behavior and temperament shane parish of farnham street blog writes in a quote people who to arbitrage time will almost always outperform the first order thought of instant gratification is a crowded path ensuring mediocre results at best delayed gratification which requires second order thinking is less crowded and more likely to get results in a similar vein howard marks has written in a quote rule number 1 most things will prove to be cyclical and rule number 2 some of the greatest opportunities for gain and loss come when other people forget rule number 1 50 years ago the best investors were the ones with an informational edge today the best investors are the one with a behavioral edge as the speed of information dissemination in the markets and competition for short term outperformance among money managers increased over the years time horizons and patience levels significantly decreased today an investor's edge is less about knowing more than others about a specific stock and more about the mindset discipline and willingness to take a long term view about the intrinsic value of a business and i have talked about the same in great detail in my book's chapter on delayed gratification and implementing some of the principles from that chapter have helped me identify some of the biggest multi baggers in my investing journey and i would like to quote a important extract from that particular chapter from my book investors generally overlook businesses that are doing things that will create significant incremental earnings 1 to 2 years from now because they don't want to wait that far out investors often shun businesses that are investing for the future and currently are suffering from low initial margins in those new initiatives because capacity gets utilized only over time and the earnings growth is back ended even if they execute well they will see little reported earnings growth for the next 4 to 8 quarters and may even see a decline resulting from incremental depreciation and poor initial margins and even if they are expected to experience an exponential jump in earnings growth after that the stock markets generally do not initially increase the market value of these businesses they do re-rate them however around the time when the earnings growth is clearly visible as investors we get an edge over competition if we pick these companies and have the patience and conviction to hold them although these businesses are clearly undervalued on a longer term basis it is psychologically challenging to invest in them and even more so to hold on to them and these difficulties result in a lack of investors and the subsequent mispricing of these stocks because the price discovery is weak when the investors attention on these stocks is low let's illustrate this through the use of a personal example so during 2018 and 2019 post the nbfc crisis the indian auto industry was in a downturn and there was an auto ancillary company named rajatan global which was undergoing a very big capacity expansion program because the entire auto sector was out of favor the investors attention on this particular stock was low but as soon as the capacity expansion got over 
in early 2020 and the earnings visibility went up post a recovery in the auto cycle the stock of rajaratnam global since april 2020 has given more than 1100% return and this is deep value investing at its finest you want to invest in such capex plays during the industry down cycle and then patiently hold on to them through the industry up cycle and then exit in a timely manner to reap maximum capital appreciation and when you're investing in such businesses during the down cycle you just have to check their balance sheet to make sure they can that they can survive another 1 to 2 years of an industry downturn successful investing is all about pattern recognition so much so that i've devoted an entire chapter in my book on pattern recognition and i quote from that chapter along with the slow and gradual macro changes investors should also be alert to tiny changes at the micro level be alert to tiny changes like the declaration of a maiden dividend receipt of a large order or a landmark contract appointment of a big four auditor increased or first time disclosures or discussions about business prospects and future plans and annual reports presentations or press releases a chairman or ceo of a listed company sharing business commentary for the first time a company holding an analyst or investor conference call for the first time or after a long time an upgrade of a company's debt instruments by the rating agencies a sudden increase in the market value of a company's bonds because bonds are more sensitive than stocks to changes in the economic fortunes of a company or notable improvements or deteriorations in the working capital cycle always monitor the direction of the quality of earnings such an elaborate and exhaustive exercise requires total dedication on part of the investor but it is highly rewarding so let me talk about the first pattern from these patterns that is always monitor the direction of the quality of earnings investing is all about delta or the rate of change and we should always focus on the trajectory of the earnings growth and its underlying quality warren buffett has very aptly said that a business should be viewed as an unfolding movie not as a still photograph refer to the snapshot from the annual report of a company in india now this is a very old company it's more than a century old from 1919 to 2005 they were in the fertilizer business and in 2005 they shut down the fertilizer business to focus on manufacturing of low margin bulk chemicals business and from 2011 onwards they shifted their focus on manufacturing of high margin specialty chemicals in early february last year the company came out with a detailed investor presentation on the bombay stock exchange website outlining their capex plans and as soon as earnings visibility went up among the investors post the release of this presentation the stock of dharamsi moraji chemicals has given more than 60% returns since that particular date this is not a stock recommendation this is purely for educational purposes and we own this stock in our flexicap small case portfolio so that was the first pattern about monitoring the direction of the quality of earnings now let's look at the second pattern which is increased or first time disclosures or discussion about business prospects and future plans in annual reports presentations or press releases now refer to this particular slide from earlier in the presentation where i had mentioned that i diligently review all of the corporate announcements on the bombay stock exchange website every day and about how working hard today helps you let good luck find you in future this is the on the right hand side of this particular slide you can see an extract from the investor presentation of a company which was released on 1st november 2021 that is 4 months ago and notice something very interesting here so the trailing 12 month sales of this company is 101 and as per the investor presentation the company is uh, doing a capex of 96 crores and they are expecting 3x asset turns so basically the revenues of this particular company are about to quadruple in the next few years and this pre particular presentation was released for the first time by the company on 1st november 2021 and since that particular date the stock of natural capsules has given more than 150% returns to investors in the last four months now let's look at the final pattern for today which is the winning of a landmark contract so in early february 2020 Navin Florin uh, won a seven-year, two thousand nine hundred crore order in its high-performance product segment. And since the 
winning of that particular contract by Navin Florin, the stock of Navin Florin has given 150% returns from February 2020 till date. Now, observe something very interesting. Out of the 150% stock price returns of Navin Florin since February 2020, almost 100% of those returns came from P re rating. The P ratio of Navin Florin basically has doubled from 40 to 80 times. Now, it's very important for us as investors to understand as to why did this happen? Why did the P ratio of Navin Florin double after winning that long duration contract? And to understand that, we have to understand the art of valuation. To be a successful investor, you don't need to do a precise DCF calculation on an extensive Excel spreadsheet. You just need to have a DCF mindset focusing on drivers of terminal value. And that in turn drives multiple re rating and derating. Be a business analyst, not a securities analyst. Because intelligent investing is all about understanding intrinsic value. So let's go back to first principles, the very basics. The intrinsic value of an asset is the sum of the cash flows expected to be received from that asset over its remaining useful life, discounted for the time value of money, and the uncertainty of receiving those cash flows. Valuation is an art form. Determining the present value of all the future cash flows of a business involves looking at the various aspects of a business's DNA, including its capital intensity, business model durability, balance sheet strength, profitability, competitive position, future growth prospects, and management bandwidth, among other factors, all weighed and compared with the current price. Some businesses are easier to value than others. Predictability of cash flows is an important factor. In other words, it is easier to value a business with stable operations and cash flows than a business with high volatility in its underlying operations every year. The intrinsic value is the sum of the present value of the cash flows during the explicit forecasting period and the present value of the terminal value. Less predictable cash flows need to be discounted at a higher rate. Now we come to one of the most important slides in this presentation, which talks about the concept of valuation. And once we are able to understand what is it that drives multiple re-rating and de-rating? What is it that drives valuation multiple re-rating, de-rating? We can greatly enhance our chances for generating alpha and outsized returns for our clients. It is the perception among investors regarding the risk of the cash flows of the business that in turn drives the discount rate that, that the investors use to value the business and that in turn drives the valuation multiple. Simple. I'll repeat. It is the risk perception among investors of the cash flows of a business that drives the discount rate they use to value the business and that in turn drives the changes in the valuation multiple. The market places a heavy weight on certainty. Stocks with the promise of years of predictable earnings growth tend to go into a long period of overvaluation until such time that they are no longer able to grow earnings in a steady manner. Predictability of long-term growth matters more to the market than the absolute rate of near-term growth. So a stock that promises to grow earnings at 50% for the next few years with no clarity thereafter, it is given a lower valuation multiple by the market than a stock that has slower but, but highly predictable growth for a much longer period. Consistent growth increases valuation. Consistent dis disruption decreases valuation. The longevity of growth is always given a greater weight by the market than the absolute rate, rate, rate of growth. So you will often notice stocks with 12 to 15 percent predictable earnings growth for the next 10 to 15 years, getting current year P multiples of 40 to 50 times. And this phenomena perplexes most new investors. But with experience, they come to appreciate the finer nuances of the market and respect its wisdom. The expensive high quality secular growth stocks tend to remain at elevated valuations for extended periods of time because investors in such stocks generally are willing to sit out periods of high valuation until earnings catch up and markets provide disproportionate rewards to companies that can provide and promise years of sustainable earnings growth. And why is that so? It's because longevity of growth is becoming increasingly scarce in today's world, which is characterized by a rapid pace of change. Sample this statistic. 88% of the companies from the Fortune 500 list of 1955, 62 years later in 2017, 88% of those companies had basically either gone bankrupt or had merged with or were acquired by another firm. And if they were still existent, they had fallen from the top five Fortune 500 list as ranked by total revenues. 
this is joseph's computer's creative destruction at its very best companies with high longevity high duration of cash flows tend to enjoy higher intrinsic value this is what is the most important again i would like to reemphasize it is the risk perception of the cash flows and the trajectory of the cash flows future cash flows of a business that drives the discount rate used by the market to value a business that in turn drives the valuation multiple which the market places upon the business so let's give a, a recent example uh, to illustrate this point so saregama limited raised 750 crores through the qip offering and uh, in the past they had a history of allocating capital in their loss making karwa and film production business but uh, once the management clarified on the con call that the entire 70 crores of the qip money will be exclusively used for the lucrative music licensing business segment only the stock of saragama limited which had already got re-rated before the qip got further re-rated because now the risk perception among investors for the cash flows of this particular business got further reduced so they reduced the discount rate they used to value the business that in turn uh, uh, just drove the valuation multiple of the business even higher so there are com- there are uh, commodity companies in india which are trying to basically get into niche specialty uh, segments and trying to lower the volatility of their future cash flows and if the management of such companies executes on their promise and their intended direction then there may be an opportunity for value investors to make outside return because in such cases once the execution starts showing up in the in the numbers the market rewards such companies with a much more higher valuation multiple so focus on where the volatility trajectory is going is, is the business becoming riskier or less riskier over time that is what drives the valuation multiple if there is one big thing that has benefited me immensely in my investing trading and wealth creation journey over the years it is this listening very attentively to and listening from peers learning from peers seniors and juniors who are much more smarter and hard working than me one should always be humble and the more you reach out to and associate with individuals whether younger or older who are better and smarter than you are the more you will learn and the faster you will improve it is better to be an average guy on a star team than a star on an average team the former will be better for you in the long term the latter is just an ego trip the people closest to you play an outsized role in your level of success or failure so choose wisely you are after all the average of the five people you associate with the most in your life the great thing about being an investor in today's digital age is that there are so many bright and hard working investors and traders on twitter whatsapp groups and telegram channels and all i need to do is listen attentively to what they are sharing and then sincerely do the required study at my end there has never been a better time to be a humble and grounded person ralph waldo emerson had said every man i meet is my master in some point and in that i learn of him learning and accepting help from others creates value far beyond our individual capabilities look at every interaction as an opportunity to learn from the people you meet you will be amazed at how quickly you grow and how much better you become both as a professional and more important as a human being so keep learning from everyone on 4th august 2000 on 1st of august 2020 one of my junior colleague somya malani had uh, presented a webinar on demergers and on 4th of august 2020 i tweeted about having watched his webinar the previous day and having learned a key lesson from the solar active pharmaceuticals demerger case study discussed by him in his presentation and that very morning i applied that learning to rd surfactants when it experienced heavy trading volume after a series of lo- lower circuits recently and since august 4th 2020 after applying the lessons learned from my junior colleague to rd surfactants the stock of rd surfactants subsequently went up more than 600% over the next one year before paring back a large part of the gains in the recent small cap mid cap correction having learned how to participate in demergers i used the same principle on 29th march 2021 last year to jubilant and gravia and since 29th march 2021 the stock of jubilant and gravia subsequently went on to give 200% plus returns in the next 6 months now in both these cases of demergers i want to clearly differentiate between two different kinds of demergers now there are various ways to play demergers but the maximum money in demergers based on my experience has been in cases of forced selling 
and forced selling takes place in two kinds of demergers one is a market cap demerger and the other is a sectoral demerger so rt surfactants was the example of a market cap demerger rt surfactants was demerged from its much more larger parent company rt industries and rt surfactants got listed as a micro cap so when inst large institutional investors who were holding shares of rt industries when they were handed over shares of this tiny micro cap rt surfactants they didn't want to have anything to do with it so they, they just tried to dump the shares of rt surfactants immediately post listing in the open market at whatever price they could fetch for the shares and the price of rt surfactants collapsed 40 50% post listing but once the selling pressure got absorbed then subsequently the stock went on to become a big multi bagger so this is an example of a market cap demerger the second demerger situation in which you get forced selling in attractive prices is that of a sectoral demerger so jubilant engravy and jubilant pharma nova were demerged from jubilant life sciences and jubilant life sciences was primarily held by pharmaceutical funds so even though jubilant jubilant engravia got listed at a decent market cap post demerger since the pharmaceutical funds were not allowed to hold a chemical company in their portfolios they were forced to sell the stock of jubilant engravia in the open market at any price they could get and the stock of jubilant engravia also fell 40 50% post listing and value investors were able to buy the stock at a very attractive price subsequently the stock gave multi bagger returns now these were two past case studies let me talk about a future case study which may take place later this year an example of a sectoral demerger so later this year arthi pharmaceuticals is going to get demerged from arthi industries and the chemical funds which hold arthi industries even though arthi pharmaceuticals may get listed at a decent market cap because those chemical funds will not be allowed to hold on to shares of a pharmaceutical company they'll be forced to dump shares of arthi pharmaceuticals at any price that they can get and alert investors may get an opportunity to buy shares of a well managed pharmaceutical business at a very attractive price so keep an eye out for that particular company this is not a stock recommendation this is being shared purely for educational purposes just to apply theory to to practice so what is the big insight that we get from all this it is that all intelligent investing is value investing if i had not self educated myself on different areas of value in the markets and instead restricted myself to only one way of investing then i would have never been able to participate in broad based bull markets and my personal investment philosophy and investment opportunity set has significantly expanded over the years with time and experience in the markets initially it was restricted to low price to earnings low price to book stocks because i started off by reading the intelligent investor by ben graham then i read Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, Phil Fisher, and I started investing in secular growth stocks at reasonable valuations. But today, it covers multiple areas of the investment universe, including commodities, cyclicals, deep value, deep mergers, and merger arbitrage. Instead of being restricted by my personal biased views to a small opportunity set, as was the case during my early years, I am now able to invest in a variety of industries and situations wherever I find mispricing of value. and a highly favorable risk and return trade off you see no single strategy works all of the time and in every kind of market and that is why it is essential to build up one's investing arsenal to be able to hunt for value from within different areas and over the years i've come to realize and appreciate just why this is so critically important it is because a bull market is always going on at all times in some specific sectors of the indian stock market between 96 to 2000 it was in technology media and communication between 2003 to 2008 it was in infrastructure commodities real estate and organized retail between 2009 and 2014 it was in discretionary consumption pharmaceuticals it services fmcg between 2005 to, to between 2015 and 2018 it was in auto specialty chemicals financials like nbfcs and microfinance companies and since uh, early 2020 it has taken place in various sub segments within india's manufacturing industry especially the import substitution place cdmos cramps building materials housing finance companies because the residential real estate industry in india has revived after almost a decade the indian government's emphasis on ethanol building has led to multiple multi baggers from that space digital transformation post covid 19 cloud computing electric vehicles multiple trends have begun since early 2020 and It is my personal conviction and belief that the opportunities in the next 20 years in India will be far greater than those in the past 20 years, and the opportunities of the last 20 years will be dwarfed by the opportunities of the next 20 years. 
and where will these opportunities come from they'll come from two sources varying perception and long term structural trends varying perception refers to situations where you get roc expansion coupled with earnings growth and you get valuation re-rating and you end up with multi baggers and varying perception comes from having a differentiated view on the short to medium term trajectory of a business there are multiple triggers for varying perception namely product mix change which may lead to high margins capex which in turn leads to operating leverage because once the pre-production costs have been uh, recovered then a large part of the revenue growth flows down to the bottom line an industry cycle shift so like i mentioned in since uh, middle of 2020 the residential real estate cycle in india has revived after almost a decade a regulatory change is also an important source for variant perception since ever since the gov government of india's uh, heavy emphasis on ethanol blending multiple multi bagger opportunities have arisen and deleveraging is another source for variant perception so as the debt goes down interest cost goes down net profit goes up market cap goes up improvement in asset turns this is another source for variant perception and you can easily get this information from management on the conference calls as to what is their expected asset turnover on the new capacity which is coming on stream and there are two sources of, of for roc expansion one is margin expansion and one is improvement in asset turnover and between the two i prefer improvement in asset turnovers because high margin tends to attract competition finally we have corporate actions which are a very good source for variant perception namely demergers reverse mergers promoter management change divestiture of a loss making business segment because post divestiture the result, resultant company's net profit goes up market cap goes up as well as divestiture of a non core business because the stock markets love focused managements focused businesses many conglomerate businesses in india tend to end up getting what is known as a conglomerate discount so once the company sells off its non core business operations and gets a more stronger focus the market generally rewards it with a higher valuation multiple and these variant perception type of situations are the kind of opportunities that we focus on in our flexi cap small case the next source of opportunities like i referred to earlier is that of long term structural trends and long term structural trends are generally found in companies in favorable industry structures so these industries are organized either as a monopoly or a duopoly or an oligopoly at best they are experiencing some form of an industry tailwind they have consistency and predictability of cash flows and they have a long runway for growth ahead so they have high visibility for many years ahead they are also characterized by value migration so for many years in india we have been having value migration from public to private unorganized to organized from offline to online and there are multiple structural growth plays in the indian market namely cdmo crams contract manufacturing specialty chemicals with critical application animal healthcare fintech music streaming e-commerce electric vehicles digital transformation and cloud computing and these are the kind of structural growth plays that we focus on in our uh, mega trend small case now here i would like to share a very very important principle for long term value creation and if the audience can imbibe this particular principle understand the implications of this particular value creation principle then they'll do very well in their stock market careers in the stock market there are two kinds of companies one with low returns on capital employed one with high returns on capital employed in case of companies with low returns on capital employed the maximum delta the maximum rate of change the maximum intrinsic value creation takes place and they focus on improving their low returns on capital employed and in case of companies with high returns on capital employed the maximum delta the maximum rate of change the maximum intrinsic value creation takes place when they focus on improving their revenue growth and variant perception helps you identify companies going from low returns on capital employed to high returns on capital employed and long term structural trends help basically help you uh, find you know very good high roc companies which are also expected to have very good revenue growth so this is uh, what we focus on in both our flexi cap and mega trend small cases both these small cases are benchmark agnostic portfolios of 25 to 30 names and the rationale for having 25 to 30 holdings in both these small cases is that it is the optimal number of holdings to maximize the risk and return trade off as per a study published in the international best seller a random walk on wall street it was shown as to how as the number of stocks in a portfolio reaches 25 to 30 names the incremental volatility reducing benefits of diversification reach near zero 
and this is the sweet spot for an active investor seeking to outperform the market at 25 to 30 stocks you have captured almost all of the benefits of diversification yet the number of companies you need to know thoroughly is still manageable and not talk about how value investing in my view is actually a life discipline investing is a field of competitive learning and in order to outperform the rest you have to outlearn the rest in august 2016 michael morbison authored a brilliant paper titled 30 years reflections on the 10 attributes of great investors and in one of my past interviews on stock and ladder blog i shared those 10 attributes along with the best books on each of those 10 attributes for the benefit of all the readers let me share uh, and quickly recap those 10 attributes with all of you today be numerate understand value properly assess strategy compare effectively think probabilistically update your views effectively beware of behavioral biases know the difference between information and influence position sizing and reading and i had added three more important attributes to michael morbison's list extreme levels of patience coupled with the ability to act decisively when the opportunities present themselves multidisciplinary thinking and inversion benjamin franklin very aptly said an investment in knowledge pays the best interest and warren buffett conquers the more you learn the more you learn the best investment you can make is an investment in yourself the value investing discipline has certain finer attributes and aspects that we come to realize and appreciate only with the passage of time and with experience with the passage of time we learn to recognize that value investing is not merely about stocks and business fundamentals it is a life discipline and i have talked about the same in my book's ch chapter on overrated behaviors and underrated behaviors and i'll share a few of them with all of you knowledge is overrated wisdom is underrated intellect is overrated temperament is underrated outcome is overrated process is underrated forecasting is overrated preparation is underrated confidence is overrated humility is underrated conviction is overrated pragmatism is underrated complexity is overrated simplicity is underrated analytical ability is overrated personal behavior is underrated having a high income level is overrated inculcating a disciplined saving habit is underrated competition with peers is overrated helping them is underrated large personal net worth is overrated good karma is underrated talent is overrated resilience is underrated being the best investor is overrated being the most authentic version of yourself is underrated i would like to conclude with two key messages from my book that the goals of investment should be happiness joy growth intellectual satisfaction and eventually peace and serenity wealth and financial prosperity are natural by products of lifelong learning and many people achieve success but to sustain the same and potentially build on it over an entire lifetime requires humility gratitude and a constant learning mindset with that i come to the end of my presentation thank you ashok okay thank you very much uh, mr gautam that was a really comprehensive session so before we move on to the q and a can we pl please jump to some advertisements next slide sir thank you one more slide please okay sir can you please run the video now sure So ladies and gentlemen the title sponsor for investor is Sher Khan one of the well known brokers in India with close to about million investors participating in their journey all right so <clears throat> thank you so much Sher Khan for being a part of our journey in this first con conference of investor
So Mr. Gautam has discussed after this, once we jump out of these slides, we will quickly move on to Q&A, all right? So, <clears throat> so we can jump to the slides, sir. You can trigger, yeah. So friends, this is to inform you that Kautilya already started the unlisted and pre-IPO division, uh, division where you can buy various unlisted stocks if you are interested. So <clears throat> primarily Kautilya focuses on 25 popular unlisted stocks. So next slide, please. One of the most popular stocks is friends Chennai Super Kings, India's most popular IPL team. So CSK has been the most valuable member of the IPL teams in India. So CSK stocks are available to be a part of your portfolio. They are a monopoly in the industry and the minimum ticket size is about 1000 shares. If you want to uh, know more about these shares, go on to www.kautilacapital.com slash unlisted for more details. Next slide, please. Here is a quick announcement of Stratazon, the Amazon fund of trading strategies, which comprises of 100% automated algo strategies for traders and investors. The beauty of this uh, fund is that it is uh, comprises of 100% algo strategies, 100% transparency in risk and returns. All the strategies are backtested, validated, okay, with proper uh, confirmation, walk forward testing and Monte Carlo simulations. 100% robot, no manual intervention. It is in fact a strategy as a service. For more details, log in to www.statazon.in slash contact us. Thank you. Next slide, please. So friends, here is an interesting update that we are coming up with Traders Conclave for the, for the first time ever, uh, which is happening in the month of September at Bangalore. One of the largest uh, retail investors and traders residential conclave happening on the 23rd and 25th of September 2022 at Sheraton Grand Hotel Whitefield. It uh, comprises of three days, eight sessions, competitions, quiz, prizes, awards and celebrations. Ideally, there will be eight speakers. Three speakers every day come and share a lovely strategy end to end with concepts, examples, scenarios, simulations and so on. It will be a massive and deeper learning. Next slide, please. Thank you, sir. We have about 187 days to go for this uh, event happening for the first time in Bengaluru. So uh, <clears throat> people who are in Bangalore South, of course, you can travel down to Bangalore for this special event. We are trying to make this uh, event uh, really different because we are building an application where we will conduct a lot of uh, activities, events, games, which are which revolves around trading world. As you know, we are all professional traders. We know how uh, traders would, uh, what traders would officially expect from a program like this to educate, empower and excel in all the activities that we do. Next slide, please. So friends, there are about six speakers coming up into this event. One is a 200 crores quant fund manager. One, one person is a GAN disciple and a master predictor. One of the speaker is a well-known Elliott wave technician in India. One guy is a million dollar fund manager and one of the well-known positional weekly option writers and finally an expert in straddle who plays about 100 lots. All these people are achievers in their own field. They manage their own funds. Uh, they, they have their own experience in the area of their focus. It will be a massive and great learning to everyone. Next slide, please. So friends, this event is uh, happening for three three days and two nights with all the meals included in a five star property. You will get VIP access to all the conclave events and also you will get to access the complete recording for lifetime. Plus, whatever is the fee that people generally pay. Uh, ideally, the, the pricing is kept at around at a very nominal rate of 25,000 so that we'll have bigger participation. OK, so the money would be refunded in the form of brokerage credits and ideally there are three champions of the conclave award which we have kept. The champion of the conclave can, can not only he'll become uh, he'll be the best among the lot and he will also have the opportunity to speak in the upcoming conferences of the future. So benefits worth 55,000 valuable knowledge and greatest possible memories would be available in this particular event. Next slide, please. So friends, this is this is the story 
of Traders Conclave. For more details, please log into www.tradersconclave.com. We have, I think, 60 seats are already full. There are about 40 seats pending. Okay, the early bird price is 24,999, inclusive of GST. As you all know, the hotel cost itself is around 20,000 rupees. So, I, I hope you understand. It is just kept at a nominal price so that we extensively focus on brand building and also build an excellent program for collaboration among all the traders and masses. This is going to be an annual event every year during the more or less the same time in the same city. All right. And it will be more like an alumni event. Every year we try to meet a different speaker with different kinds of learnings and that continuous vicious continuous learning what we call as Kaizen will keep happening in this particular program. So go ahead, log into tradersconclave.com. If you want, uh, you can uh, check out the details on the website and uh, reach out to the team. They will be in a position to help you. Sir, next slide, please. So that's the early bird offer. Price is not 35999 It will be 24999 and it will be on a rolling basis. Every 100 seats filled, the prices will multi increase. And if you want to reach out, you can contact our conclave manager. His name is Fazil and that's his mobile number and his telegram ID is Traders Conclave. Feel free to reach out to him. Another 40 seats to be filled at the same price. After this, uh, the pricing will as usual increase. All right. <clears throat> Next slide, sir. Superb. Now we come to the end of the program. I hope everyone of you enjoyed the keynote session and it's time for Q&A. Please go ahead, shoot the questions. We have roughly about 15 minutes because Mr. Gautam has a hard stop. So we would like to wind up. So, of course, in a single session, you had so much of learning. I think you consumed, we consumed almost 60 slides today. But definitely, once you go back and watch the video once again, the video recording, uh, it will definitely help you. And I'm sure, I'm sure there's a lot, each slide has a lot more stories to share. And uh, in fact, Gautam Ji, <laughs> you were on a roller coaster ride. It was like a metro train traveling at very high speed. Some people are buzzing. <laughs> Some concepts are going beyond my thinking. Naturally, friends, experience of 20 years, if it is jam-packed into a session of 60 minutes, it definitely goes over your head. No worries. Let's move on. Please shoot down your question. So the first question goes like this from Suchita Kubal. If a stock is falling on demerger news, how will I know the level to enter that particular stock? Simple. So basically what happens is after uh, once a new stock gets listed post the merger, it is, it is in the trade to trade segment T to D segment for 10 for the first 10 trading days. That is when uh, generally this high intensity selling takes place. All that all that you have to do is be, uh, be alert and just observe the volumes. The day you notice large volumes taking place, that means the selling pressure is get finally getting absorbed and the selling pressure is about to come to an end. And that is the time to get in. So basically uh, in the first uh, five, six days, the stock may hit lower circuit, but on the seventh or eighth day, once it comes out of the lower circuit on heavy volume, and that is the time to actually get in at a very attractive price. So just uh, once the lower circuit is broken, that is the time to enter, provided that there is large volumes with which the stock breaks the lower circuit and starts moving to the upside. Sounds good. So here is a question from Mr. Raman. After this stellar run by specialty chemical business or any other business in the past one and a half year, how will you assess the future performance? Well, each business has to be valid on its own merit. Uh, and uh, I believe the multiple tailwinds now taking place for the uh, specialty chemical sector, especially the China plus one theme is uh, very, very promising. And with the recent episode of what has happened, uh, the entire world is now looking for an alternative to China. It, to, as of today, China is the leading player in the global chemicals market. But with uh, the recent uh, state of events and the recent developments that have taken place, the world is increasingly looking to uh, have an alternate supplier along with China. So there's, I think, a long runway ahead for growth for the uh, specialty chemicals industry in India. Sounds good. One more question by Mr. Guru. Based on current market situation, where do you think we are headed in terms of valuation and growth? Valuations, I believe, after the recent correction are pretty well, very, very reasonable, especially in the small cap and mid cap space, because that is where the maximum uh, 
stock price correction happened over the next last few months many good quality stocks actually fell 30 40% while the index the sensex and the nifty barely corrected 10% so just be bottom up be stock specific focus on individual businesses focus on value there is no other of opportunities even in today's market there are enough opportunities to make a very healthy long term compounded uh, cagr over the next uh, many years sounds good a uh, question by mr mohammad shabad i'm sorry shadab insurance sector are now at very cheap valuation is it right time to enter well, uh, to be honest uh, the general insurance and life insurance industry even though the uh, long term prospects look good they're gen- actually outside my personal circle of competence so i won't be able to really comment on that particular question for the but the long term structural growth aspects broadly speaking are in place if you have the ability to understand the, uh, the business model of uh, individual insurance companies then there can be some good opportunities in that space i would highly recommend uh, 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 the detailed webinar done by scientific investing uh, youtube channel on the insurance industry i believe uh, they had done a very extensive webinar on this particular industry sounds good okay here is a question by mr devendra nemade sir can you recommend a book for managing emotions in investing well a very uh, so jason zweig uh, from the wall street journal has written an excellent book titled your money and your brain that's a very very good uh, book for learning how to overcome behavioral biases and obviously da- daniel kahneman's classic thinking fast and slow is a must read for anyone under- wanting to understand how behavioral biases work so those two books are very good reading one interesting question by mr kochar how are the us sanctions on russia going to affect indian economy well many of us investors are so bullish on india all the time we just think if anything goes wrong with any country in the world all that opportunity will naturally flow down to india it doesn't work that way and uh, we have to understand that uh, russia is a major player in the global en- energy market and india is, as of today still imports a large percentage of its crude oil requirements from overseas so you know oil going to uh, going all going up to 100 dollars is not good news for india so we have to understand how these you know various macros are interrelated and the second and third order consequences because with crude over 100 dollars you can expect a series of interest rate hikes in india as well that's not generally good news for cost of capital and for equities in general so it's very important to focus on no debt or low debt companies and companies with very strong balance sheets because in a rising interest rate environment what happens is their leverage competitors fall by the wayside they go out of business and these uh, companies with strong balance sheets and no debt on their balance sheets they are the ones to gain market share i think that is the right way to look at it sounds good which is your favorite sector to invest right now by mr paul debarma <laughs> i'll quickly actually show it on these at mention so many of these sec- promising sectors here so i'm bullish on these th- themes in particular for the long term cdmo crams contract manufacturing specialty chemicals with critical application animal healthcare because this entire animal healthcare industry globally is very consolidated so at stellavel at stellavel partners we look for consolidated profit pools and we basically look at where does this business lie within the overall value chain because within the entire value chain of a of a industry we want to focus on that part of the value chain which has got the minimum competition or which or which has got a monopoly player or a duopoly uh, kind of structure because that is where the profit margins are the maximum the fattest and that is where you can you make the most money as a, as a shareholder so focus on consolidated profit pools and focus on businesses which are the most dominant in their uh, underlying industry fintech music streaming e-commerce electric vehicles digital transformation cloud computing all of these are very very promising themes within electric vehicles i would like to point out here that you know many of these uh, electric vehicle oems which are private they are getting a lot of private equity and private uh, market funding so they may resort to irrational pricing and irrational competition so the way to profit from such a situation is look for auto ancillary companies which are supplying which are the sole supplier 
for a critical component to this electric vehicle OEMs because that is where I think the large amount of money can be made. You want to basically see competition in, in increases fric friction and that is a hindrance for value creation. More competition, more friction, less value creation. So you want to focus on areas within the value chain of any industry where there is minimum competition. That is the way to long term success in the stock market. Sounds good. Mr. Radha Krishna Jagatap is asking, sir, by any chance do you consider technical indicators any time at whichever time frame to understand the market movement? Not the market movement, but for individual stocks, especially for cyclicals and commodity businesses, I do make use of technical indicators and I'll illustrate that with the help of these two cases. So, like I mentioned, RT surfactants went up 600% post demerger. Uh, Jubilant and Grivia went up 200% post demerger, but subsequently they gave up a large part of those gains. Now, the, I, I use technical indicators like uh, the break of a 21 day uh, moving average or a 50 day moving average to basically get out of my multi bagger positions in these cyclical and commodity names because they help you uh, be disciplined and preserve a large part of the profits because these the large profits multi bagger returns in these cyclical and commodity businesses can easily vanish uh, very very quickly as well. So it's like easy come easy go but you, at the end of the day the profits that you book are what really matters. So the key to succeeding uh, in techno fund investing is to be disciplined to your for to be to your process. You have to be ultra ultra disciplined. Whatever happens after your buy or sell decision, that's completely not in your hand. But what is in your hand is following a sound process consistently. Investing at the end of the day is a probabilistic activity, which means that even if you follow a sound process, sometimes the end result may not be in your favor, but that's all. Absolutely all right because the idea is to be more right than wrong over a long period of time. Just a few big winners over your investing or trading career will make it will do the job for you. Hi God. Hi God. I missed you for a second. Sure. So just I was just talking about God, the I'm importance there. of being. I'm there. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so I was just talking about being disciplined in the process. So investing is a probabilistic activity. So just focus on following a sound process. The outcome is not in our hand, but the process is in, is in our hand. Just focus on following a sound process. Superb. So one question by Mr. Ramesh, sir, how to how do you understand and get the real intrinsic value of a stock? And I don't focus on getting the precise intrinsic value for stock because see the in, the actual intrinsic value, the correct intrinsic value of a business is changing on a daily basis, right? We just have to be approximately right than being precisely wrong. As long as the you get the general sense of uh, the long term trajectory of a business in case of uh, um, the long term compounders or or as long as you have a differentiated view on the short to medium term trajectory of a business over the next one to three years. That is based on variant perception. As long as you get the big picture correct, that is all that really matters. I don't really, uh, I have never tried to calculate the exact intrinsic value on a spreadsheet. All that I do is I just look at the big picture, try to understand the uh, the management integrity and the past execution track record. Management quality is very, very important. And uh, the, generally how they have uh, behaved with the shareholders in the past in their other group companies gives you a fair indication of how they'll behave with shareholders in their the new business which they take over. So do evaluate management. It's a very, very important thing to look at when investing in the Indian market. So one interesting question by Sudhir Mane. He says, sir, what is a P ratio sector wise to make entry of shares? Benjamin, Benjamin Graham tells us about P ratio in around 20, which is never found in a good company at such low P rates. How do I proceed ahead for buying the shares? So very good question and I've actually uh, covered this in extensive detail in my uh, first chapter on the third week of my first chapter that that third week is titled the art of valuation in which I actually dem demonstrated and showcase how to derive the justified P multiples for a given company given the growth rate of the company's earnings and the company's underlying return on invested capital. So it's not there right now here, but uh, in my earlier presentations, there was an appendix in which basically I was talking about the justified valuations for high quality businesses with high longevity of growth. So there uh, 
basically if it was possible to actually get a sense of the right multiples let me see if i actually have it in this in this presentation actually is, it, is my screen visible yes visible so valuation is not an exact science but a fine art uh, and value of any firm equals to steady state value plus the future value creation plus the excess cash minus the debt and the future value creation or the future value of the firm is equal to the reinvestment capital multiplied by the roc less the cost of capital into the multiplied by the competitive advantage period this entire thing is then divided by the cost of capital that is this that is how you get the future value of a firm and one needs one needs to take a holistic view of valuation with due consideration given to the nature of the business whether it is a secular growth business or a cyclical business and the longevity of growth volatility of the cash flows return on invested capital reinvestment opportunities and the competitive advantage of a business so let's, let's look at briefly look at this particular table uh, this table is taken from a white paper published by epoch investment partners research you can get it on their website as well and this particular table shows you the justified or fair value p multiples uh, for a particular uh, for you know dif uh, for different levels of uh, roic less the cost of capital and different levels of earnings growth so as the chill so you will basically not you will basically notice here then that what i just said uh, uh, earlier in the presentation that for companies with high earnings growth they want to basically you know with high returns on capital they want to focus on improving revenue growth and uh, for companies with low roic they want to basically improve focus on improving their roic so at different levels of uh, earnings growth and roic you will get different fair value p multiple so do read this particular white paper by epoch investment partners one more very important thing so the market tends to underprice quality over long time periods and fund smith uh, which is a very re renowned fund in the uk as per their fund owners manual uh, they had mentioned that since stock markets typically value companies on the not unreasonable assumption that their returns will regress to the mean businesses whose returns do not do this can become undervalued and therein lies our opportunity as long term investors and terry smith of fund smith has said in a quote if you plan to hold a share for the long term the rate of return on capital it generates and can reinvest at is far more important than the price at which you buy or sell so uh, this particular chart is taken from one of uh, fund smith's past uh, letters it shows the fair p ratio you could have paid in january 1973 for earning 7% cagr and if you look at this particular chart you'll notice that for a company like l'oreal group you could have paid as high as 281 times p ratio in 1973 and you could have still ended up making a 7% cagr up to september 2019 similarly for altria group lint brown forman hershey colgate heineken burst off pepsico you could have paid astronomically high p multiples and still ended up making a good return of 7% which was more than what the msci world returned over the time same time period from 1st january 1973 to 30th september 2019 but this obviously is uh, based on hindsight in real life it would generally pays to be conservative and be more prudent and uh, it's fine to pay up for quality but try not to overpay for quality now that is where the judgment and experience comes in as an investor so just to try to uh, you know have a working knowledge of the fair p ratio multiples you can get that from this particular table from epoch investment partners research and also go through the uh, this particular topic in the book titled valuation uh, measuring and managing the value of companies even the authors there also have actually demonstrated very nicely how different companies with different levels of roic and, and growth should be valued at different p multiples so do read that particular book so sir we will pick up one last question before we conclude uh, mr mm -hmm. sivahalli shiva prasad is asking are the small cases mentioned available for investment yes uh, this our small cases went live for subscription on 5th december uh, 2021 so it's, it's uh, been in operations for the last 3 uh, and a half months sounds good
So one last question by Arun Ayer. Do you advise blend portfolio of value core stocks held for life and momentum swing trades? If you can uh, do both of them well, why not? I mean, in fact, uh, in my view, a portfolio uh, well made is one made up of multiple mega trends which provide long term compounding coupled with shorter term tactical opportunities in the form of deep value and special situations like merger arbitrage, demergers, cyclicals, commodities. I think the, uh, you, along with long term compounding returns, you also get a shorter term alpha generation. So that's a portfolio well constructed, well made. But whatever we do, just follow a, dis a sound process in a disciplined manner consistently. That is the key to long term success in the stock market. Just avoid hopping from one strategy to another, uh, depending on which style or sector or style of investing is in fashion. That is something to be avoided because there, there will be certain years or a year or two in between in your long term journey, which in which your style may be out of favor. But that's just momentary and temporary. The important thing is to focus on the long term trajectory, the long term game, because investing at the end of the day is a long term game. The more time you give it, the more the chances of success. Superb. Sounds good, sir. <clears throat> so, Mr. Gautam, with this, we successfully come to the end of the session. Thank you for your wonderful keynote. It was quite insightful today. On behalf of all the participants of Investin 1.0, the Money Control Pro members, the family of Sher Khan, and all the members of the Extended Traders Gurukul family, we extend our sincere thanks for joining our event today and sharing your invaluable knowledge with every one of you. So every one of us, sorry. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Ashok. This was a pleasure. Thank you. So friends, that's the story for today. I hope every one of you enjoyed the show. I will see you all tomorrow at sharp 8 p.m. with yet another interesting session. Until then, signing off, Ashok Devanampriya from Traders Gurukul. Thank you very much. Have a good night. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.